warm welcome to everyone who is here today, especially those of you who are visiting with us. We're glad that you are here today and have joined us in our worship period. Uh, if you are visiting with us, we would request that you fill out a visitor's card and put that in the collection plate. We would appreciate you doing that for us and uh, allowing us the opportunity to get to know you and meet you. We'll begin our worship by sing song number 643, The Lord My Shepherd Is, and following this song will be led in our first prayer. Oh, 643. The Lord my shepherd is, I shall be well supplied, since he is mine and I am Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come together this Sunday to worship you. We thank you for the many families around us that we're allowed to come and worship you with. We thank you for every Sunday that we're allowed to do this. And we thank you for how each day that we can see all your beautiful blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll sing number 310 before the Lord's Supper. Number 310. Oh, what wondrous love I see freely shown for you and me by the one who did atone, just to show his matchless grace, Jesus suffered for the race. Oh, <laughs> 
Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that the sacrifices of the old covenant, though offered time after time, fell short of making those who worship perfect in conscience, conscience because they did not take away sins. The frequency of those sacrifices served as a reminder of sins year by year. We're told that the consciences of the people were not, by those sacrifices, cleansed from the de their dead works. We know some of the activities of the righteous who lived under the Old Covenant. We're told in Hebrews 11 that the faith of those individuals was so great that the world was not worthy of them, that all those gained approval uh, through their faith, and yet they did not receive what was promised, because God had provided something better for us so that apart from us, they would not be made perfect. Hebrews 11, verse 40. But we... Even, even we who likely will never be tasted, tested as these were have received in these last days a sacrifice without shortcomings. By this new covenant, we have received the one sacrifice that makes perfect all the faithful of all time. Who but the one and only Son of God became the long-purposed and publicly displayed propitiation in his blood for us. That is to say, not for righteous or good people, but for terrible sinners having no expectation but judgment in the consuming fire of hell. The reality of the contrast between Christ and man is so extreme as to seem ludicrous to compare. And yet Hebrews chapter 2, verse 11 makes it clear how we are viewed by Christ by telling us that both he who sanctified, sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one Father, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. This is more than difficult for us to understand. The intervention of Christ on our behalf, making possible the separation of us from our sins and from the eternal consequence of our sins. Each of us and all of mankind were in such a state so that no earthly fix was possible. Each of us, the fix was not from earth, but from heaven and came down to earth. Of Christ, it is recorded in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. But even for the creator of the world, this was a demanding task. In saving us from our own deeds, Christ followed the, rule, followed the rules of God's universe, which demanded a, a righting of all wrong committed by all generations of man from Adam until the end of the world. There was no easy fix, <clears throat> no way to circumvent all that God is and that he had preordained and established according to his own righteousness. But if Christ were told, therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted in that which he has suffered, he is able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. By considering these things, <clears throat> we will have done what is commanded in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1, to consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. And what else might we consider about Christ? that the reproaches he suffered were in fact ours. The bread we eat is his body, and the cup we drink is his blood. We eat and drink now in remembrance of him. Amen. <clears throat> Dear Father, we are mindful now that what your Son has done for us could not be done by 
any other and could not be done in any other way. It's beyond us to truly understand our need and, and how dire our situation was and, and how marvelous the sacrifice of your son was on our behalf. But we do try to understand, Father, and do try to uh, realize the great sacrifice and the great price paid by your son and by you for us. <clears throat> Be with us now, Father, as we uh, partake of this bread that represents the, the body of your son on the cross, all that he suffered and, and how he died for our sake. May we never take it for granted, Father, and never uh, sin willfully against you again. Be with us as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. Dear Father, we thank you for the sprinkled blood and the, and the blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. <clears throat> Help us, Father, not to refuse uh, the calling that we have, not to refuse uh, the calling from you and from your Son that we live a life, a better life than, than our past that we show you by our lives that we appreciate the, the gift of your precious son and that we uh, devote ourselves to, uh, to living such a life from, from here on. We thank you, Father, for your establishment of this, com this memorial that we can remember your son who died on our behalf and suffered great things because of us and because of our sin. Be with us, Father, as we partake of this emblem. In Jesus' name, amen.
Dear Father, we're thankful that, uh, that you are faithful to your promises. Help us, Father, be, to be content with what we have and, and make sure that we are free from the love of money. Help us to not neglect doing good and sharing with others, for we know that with these sacrifices you are pleased. And we pray that you would help us to remember that as we now give back a, a portion of what we've been blessed with. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Following the lesson, we'll be singing number 207, if you'd like to mark that, number 207. This morning, before our scripture reading, we'll sing number 121, do all in the name of the Lord. <coughs> what are you doing, word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord? Do not be Today's scripture reading will be 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 22, and I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just, the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went up and preached to the spirits in prison who formerly were disobedient when once the divine long-suffering waited. In the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience toward God 
through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God. Angels and authorities and powers have been made subject to him. Good morning. What a wonderful day it already has been. The songs that have been selected for us, the prayers that have been led, the sentiments of worship toward God. You know, it's just nice to be in a room that is worshiping God. We spend so much of our days in a world that is not cognizant of Him, that it simply ignores God, whether it's our workplace or uh, a recreation place or uh, other places. It's just nice to be in a place for a little while. Uh, for a moment, as it were, that we are able to worship God in spirit and in truth. I want to imagine, if you would with me for a moment, that it's cold outside. <laughs> I know I'm leaving that possibility going to Texas, but uh, imagine it's cold outside. Your coat has holes in it, your pants have holes in it, even, even your shoes have holes in them. You have no home, no place to call home, and no, no hope of getting a home. And as you walk down the sidewalk on this particular cold, frigid night, there's an icy drizzle that is falling on you, and, and you look up, and there, just off the sidewalk, is a house. And the house is lit up from the inside. The chimney billows of warm smoke telling you that, the, that it's warm inside. And you see people in there. There must be 20 or 30 people, and they're having a party, and there's, there's ham on the table, maybe some pizza or whatever it is your favorite food is. It's there, and they're, they're laughing and they're smiling, and, and uh, uh, you're watching those, those revelers inside as they're celebrating. You, you don't know what they're celebrating with, but you're, in your heart you're wishing it. I wish I could be a part of that. I want to have just a bite of that ham, maybe. Or I, I want to laugh alongside them. I want to celebrate with what they're celebrating. But you're stuck outside. And maybe just at that moment, the wind blows especially hard. And you feel the separation and the loneliness from that celebration. But then... Just as suddenly as the wind kicked up, the front door opens and the owner of the house sees you and calls to you and says, come in, come get out of the cold, come and celebrate with us. What do you do? What do you do? He seems earnest enough and honest enough that he really wants you to come in. Would you go in? You see, this represents life. God is throwing a celebration, a banquet for all of those who have received salvation. The whole house is filled with joy and smiles and hope. But the sinner, the sinner is on the outside, cold and dreary, hungry, freezing and, and hopeless. And then God comes to the door and he invites the sinner into the party. Come and join us. What does the sinner do? Or more pointedly, what would you do? Now let's say in this moment, in this beautiful scene of invitation, you decide, I'm going to join. I'm, I'm going to accept the invitation. I'm going to have that ham. I'm going to have those laughs. I want to feel that warmth embrace me like a warm blanket. I want exactly what they have. But the question is, at what point do you actually join the celebration? Is it when you're still standing on the sidewalk, shivering from the cold, and you've made that decision? Is that when you've joined the celebration? Or is it maybe when you start walking toward the house on that little a uh, sidewalk that connects the main sidewalk to the house, and you're walking toward the front porch, is, is it at that point that you have joined the celebration? 
Are you inside the warmth? Are you feasting on the ham? Or you get right up to the door and the owner says one more time, oh, we're so glad you've chosen to join with us. But you're still standing on the porch. Are you in the celebration? Have you joined the party? I mean, you've made the decision. You've done a uh, uh, part of the work of getting up to at least the door. But we understand that we don't actually go into the party until we what? We cross over the threshold, right? Once we get over that threshold and the door closes behind us, the celebration begins. We are in the midst of the comfort of the home. You have to thro- cross that threshold. This morning, what I would like to do is examine that threshold. Let's see what it is. Let's let the scriptures speak at the, about the moment that anyone's, me or you or anyone outside of this building or around the world or at any given time since the cross, uh, what is the threshold that we must cross over to get into salvation? Nobody ever needs to wonder, what must I do to be saved? Because the Bible so clearly tells us. If you have your Bibles, I would encourage you to turn to 1 Peter 3. We're going to focus on verse 21 this morning. I appreciate Chris reading for us, beginning in verse 18, though, because it really does set the context for us. Because it says that Christ also suffered once for, this, for sin, the righteous for the unrighteous, that is, Jesus being the righteous one who is, uh, uh, suffered, or suffered or died for the unrighteous. And what's, what's not as apparent for us here uh, in the English, in the, in the Greek, it's very clear that the righteous here is singular, a righteous one, and he is uh, suffering for the sins for the unrighteous ones, plural. And so he's not just a one-to-one ratio, it's one for all, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh and made alive in the spirit. First Peter deals a lot with suffering, and oftentimes it, it compares our suffering with the suffering of Jesus. And the point that Peter is making is whatever we may face, or whatever we may uh, encounter in this life as far as uh, turmoil and trials and suffering, know this, that Christ has already done that. And not only has he gone through the suffering, but he has done it with a purpose. And that purpose is the righteous for the unrighteous. He says specifically that he was being put to death. That is, we know that Jesus was crucified on the cross, put to death in the flesh, but he has been made alive in the spirit, that is, that uh, there is a resurrection from the dead that he has experienced. And so Peter explains Christ's work in salvation as suffering, dying, and resurrection. And those three things are important because uh, they combine to usher in salvation for human history, including, I would say, ancient history. Uh, For example, Noah, that's the one that Peter gives us specifically in this context. Now, in verse 19, and, uh, the, the, the meaning there is somewhat obscure. Uh, the, 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 the Greek language can be translated in a couple of different ways. And then there's some variants that are thrown in there. What exactly does it mean that he went in the Spirit to preach to those who are in prison who were once disobedient? Uh, I have some ideas on that. I know some other people that, have, uh, you know, that are smarter than me have other ideas on that. But don't get bogged down in the minutia of exactly what that means so much as understanding what Peter is trying to convey to us, that Jesus' death and his resurrection affects all of human history, not just the time of the cross, but it reaches all the way back to the time of Noah. It reaches all the way back to the Garden of Eden. In fact, what we find is is that uh, uh, the, the salvific work of Christ in human history covers everything from the Garden until this very moment. And so we trust and what he is able to do because of his death and resurrection. But then that brings us down to verse 21. And we're just going to go through this line by line for just a moment and look at what what is happening. He begins with baptism. Baptism is the subject of the sentence. Uh, While the Spirit is involved in baptism, John 3, 3 uh, 3 through 5, that we must be born again, born of the water and the Spirit, However, this is not referring to spirit baptisms, as some people refer to it, in which the Holy Spirit envelops us in some way that is extraordinary, 
uh, but rather it's simply talking about water baptism, at which point the Spirit regenerates our spirit, Titus 3 and verse 5, the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Spirit. We know the regeneration process comes from the Holy Spirit. The Bible is very clear about that. The question is, when does the Spirit regenerate us? And here Peter tells us that baptism, now baptism is from that, that Greek word baptism, actually it's baptisma, but we get the idea. It's a transliteration of the word itself. And, and it means to, to immerse or to plunge, to, to dip, to submerge. Uh, by definition, the word inherently cannot mean to pour or to sprinkle or to uh, anoint or to flick water on, on someone or something. Uh, that simply doesn't fit into the, the definition of the word. But even, even the New Testament tells us this by its usage of the word baptism. For example, it tells us that John baptized in the Anon in John 3 and verse 23. And it says that the reason why he was doing it is because water was plentiful there. Again, if we were just pouring or sprinkling or something, then why does there need to be plentiful water uh, for them there? In Acts chapter 8, in verse 38, Philip, after he's taught the eunuch, the eunuch says, what hinders me to be baptized? Verse 38 says, they both went down into the water. Again, indicating that this is a a immersion in water. In fact, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, Paul writes that we, uh, those who have been saved, those who have received salvation, we were buried therefore with him by baptism into death. And so the, the very act of baptism itself where one is immersed in the water, where he's submerged beneath the water, it is a, a, a an indication of, or it's a it's a symbolic of the burial that Jesus experienced himself. And so that burial in the water is indicative of the burial which Jesus went through. And of course, he goes on and says that he was resurrected and we are raised from the waters to walk in a newness of life, a resurrected life, we might say. Again, in, in the book of Colossians, Paul writing, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through faith, in the powerful working of God, Colossians 2 and verse 12. And again, having been buried with him in baptism. Baptism is a burial. And we simply don't get that in some of the modern definitions of baptism that some use today of sprinkling or pouring or something like that. It was an immersion, a burial within the water. So when Peter says baptism, which corresponds to this, he's not talking about an envelopment of the Spirit. He's not talking about uh, uh, being sprinkled, but he's talking about uh, being buried in the water of baptism uh, so that they can be raised, walking in the noose of life. But then he gives the connection, which corresponds to this specifically. The connection between history and modernity is that the flood, the flood of Moses and the flood of baptism. Now notice how Peter uses uh, to equate these. First, both are empowered by the work of Christ. That's the overarching theme of the paragraph from verses 18 through 22. is about the, the working of Christ and how it empowers everything else, including the flood of Moses and the flood of baptism. But second, notice that, that Peter emphasizes the water. Uh, they were brought safely through water. And so water is the idea here that is required for both the flood to save Moses or Noah and, and uh, uh, the, uh, uh, I said Moses a while ago, didn't I? I apologize for that. We're talking about Noah. Uh, the, to save both Noah through the flood and also us through the flood of baptism. And number three, I would say that in connection here, uh, this, this made a, are, are, are put to death and made alive, of course, is by the by the grace and working of God in order to save humanity, all of humanity. And so uh, we would understand, thirdly, that the grace of God saved them, saved Noah through the water, saves us through the water as well. That's the connection between ancient history and modern days. And we have to be aware of that. And Peter is telling us that uh, baptism, which corresponds to this, uh, the uh, New King James that Chris was reading from a moment ago, uh, uses the word antitype. This is the antitype 
Um, and so that, that's an important part. Uh, our baptism, understand, has connections with the flood of Noah, but it is not meant to be a, a, an exact recreation of it, right? Uh, in other words, when I, when I accept the invitation of Christ and, and am baptized for the remission of my sins, the world is not covered in a global flood in that moment, right? It's not a one-to-one -one exact recreation. But uh, baptism is the antitype. And, and we get that word antitype from the Greek antitype. Uh, and what it means is that uh, uh, there is the substance and there is the shadow. There is the type and there is the antitype. And the antitype is the form. It is the, uh, the real. It's the whole. And it strikes the ribbon and it leaves the type on the page. Now, the page may be removed from the typewriter, but you know what remains? It's the antitype. And so for the character A or the character B on your typewriter, I know kids are going, what's a typewriter? I understand that's, <laughs> what's that? You know, uh, uh, but, but the idea is, uh, uh, you know, you're, you're typing on your computer and you, you're on your little Word document there and you type the letter A and you can save that, that file and you can send it to somebody else. But you know what stays right there in front of you? Is, is, is the A on the keyboard. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't go with the file. It stays. It's the substance. And what's on the screen is just a shadow. And that's exactly the picture that, that Peter is painting for us in this instant. He says that this baptism is the antitype, and Noah and the flood, that was, that was just a foreshadowing of the baptism was to come. It was the type of which baptism is the antitype. The ESV, or the King James says, the light figure whereunto, which is great language. Uh, but, and and we've, we've learned how to work around and explain what that exactly means, but that's it. Uh, and it comes from this, this Greek word, antitupos, is in the Greek, but it's uh, transliterated as antitype. And, and so it's the same word, and it means that, the, that baptism becomes the substance, and the flood is just a shadow of what was to come. That's the connection. But then there is the salvation itself. It now saves you. I like that the, the original language has that word now. Right now, at this point, in this moment of time, now it saves you. Well, what about today in 2022? Uh, does it still save us? It absolutely does. Like the flood that saved Noah, baptism now saves you. What was then is now in effect, Peter is saying, and we are still under the same law that Peter was under, we are still guided by the same principle that Peter was, was speaking of. And so that baptism or that water that once saved Noah now saves us. Now, some will accuse us and say, well, that, that's just baptismal regeneration. Now, let me tell you a little bit about that phrase. What that means is they're saying that the waters of baptism save you. That the actual baptism, the water, somehow holy or has extra power, but the, 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 the real secret is there's, there's nothing about this water in the baptistry that is special. It's not holy. It has not been blessed. Uh, there, it's just plain water. And we are not saying that regeneration comes from the water. Regeneration does not come from the act of baptism. You know, I, I, don't, I don't have to keep going back to baptism every time I sin because John assures us that if we, ha if we say we have no sin, then we are liars and the truth is not in us. The fact is, we as Christians still sin, but we don't have to go back to the waters of baptism for regeneration because the waters of baptism didn't regenerate us in the first place. Salvation comes from God. He saved us, not by works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3.5. That, that's how we know that we've been saved. Not because the water was warm that day or cool that day or blessed that day or holy that day, but because in that moment that we submitted to baptism, God sent His Spirit and regenerated or renewed us, reinvigorated our spirits, which was once saturated by sin, 
It has now been washed away. Baptism is a, as a commandment. Uh, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, Acts 2 and verse 38. Every time we see baptism as a commandment or an imperative, it's always in the passive voice. And it's because we cannot baptize ourselves because in the moment of baptism, there's a regeneration. And if we could regenerate ourselves, regenerate our own spirit, wash away our own sins, we wouldn't need Jesus. We wouldn't need God. And so it's a passive. And most, most translators and interpreters understand that to be what we call a divine passive, meaning it's something that we submit to and that God does the action of. And so we submit to baptism, and God washes our lives clean. He does the action of saving us. Sin is the peril. It's what jeopardizes our souls, what puts us in danger. But at baptism, those sins are washed away, regenerated, uh, regenerating our spirit by the Holy Spirit, Acts twenty two sixteen. And so baptism becomes that threshold. We're outside the party. We're outside the celebration. We're standing at the threshold until we're baptized. And in that moment, we step into the celebration. In that moment, we're in the house and we receive all the blessings that are there. He goes on to say that it is not the removal of dirt from the body, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. It's the idea of a request. Baptism is not a bath for the body. It is a bath for the soul, where God does the scrubbing in light of Jesus' suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. It is the appeal or the request for a good conscience to God. And there's several ways that this has been translated. The Greek is, is really, there's no variant here, but the, the English has been translated in several different ways. Uh, the most obvious way, though, is that when we are baptized, it is in that moment that we are requesting from God this good conscience. That is, I know I have sinned. God, take away my sins. Wash me clean. We may not say those words, but the action of submitting to baptism, that is a request that God deal with our sins. And then finally, the power. Peter returns back to this idea through Jesus Christ. Uh, that is, by, by our, our faith in Jesus' sacrifice and resurrection. And I think resurrection here is indicative of that suffering and, and put to death and made alive in verse 18. Uh, it's the same idea coming here. Resurrection is, is referring to all of that, everything that Jesus did in his salvific work. You see, without Jesus' work, there is no means by which a holy God can deal with our sins. He had to have this sacrifice and his son was willing to do that for me. And so baptism is that threshold. So what, all, what does all of this mean? What does it mean for us here and now? First, I, I do want to mention that faith and repentance and confession are essential parts of the salvation process. I know we haven't really talked about them here. We trust in, Christ, uh, in, in the work of Christ that it gives the power to save, yes, but, but faith uh, in Jesus as the Lord, repentance, to change of heart and a change of mind, which results in this changed life, uh, confession that Jesus is the Lord, they are all essential parts of the salvation process. It's, it's just like, you know, uh, uh, standing on the sidewalk on that frigid night looking into the, into the, the house with the celebration. You know, the decision is a vital part of the process of getting into the celebration. The walk from the sidewalk up to the door, that is an essential part. If you don't do that, you're, you're, you can't get to the threshold, right? You know, standing at the door, chatting with the owner, those, that's, that's all essential. You have to do those things. But we don't enter the party until we cross the threshold. We are not saved. We are not saved until... We are baptized. I know a lot of people will come along and say, well, I believe you're saved at faith only. 
faith. When you believe, you are saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. In fact, it tells us a man is not justified by faith only, James chapter 2. And if you require faith, what more is it to require baptism as well? We're both requiring something, some action, some indication on the part of the responder. This person says belief. The Bible says baptism now saves you. What about you this morning? Are you still standing on the sidewalk? Is the cold getting bitter? Is the longing for the warmth and the celebration Maybe it's palpable now. I want to be a part of God's saved family. Listen, you could poll anyone in this audience, and they'll say this. They want you to be saved too. This morning, if you have a need to respond to his invitation, be baptized for the remission of your sins, cross that threshold. I wanted to bring in the whole bride over the threshold. You know, the church is the bride of Christ. Uh, But it's that idea. God will carry us in if we will submit to his commandments. If you desire to make that invitation, to answer it this morning, won't you come while you stand and while we sing. For the gentle voice of Jesus Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for the many blessings that you give us. Lord, we're so thankful for your Son and the sacrifice that he gave. Lord, we know that we can never repay. We can never thank you enough. Lord, we're just so thankful for the means that you've given us for through baptism, that we can be cleansed and our sins forgiven. Lord, we pray that as we leave this place today, that you watch over us, that we continue to focus on you so that we can stay on the straight and narrow, and that we can one day be at home with you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen.